Manchester topography. When I say I know this city, I mean I know it by its men. I mean the giving of directions is an unfolding like an atlas, like a parting of lakes. I mean I know it by the long avenue of my body laid down nightly between home and somewhere else, or by the bus stop. There was the morning's quiet leaving, or the last fine cafe, or the open zip of the canal. I mean, I may not have ever learned the proper names for anywhere, but their voices are still the dull traffic when I cannot sleep. When I offer you my hand, come with me. Let me show you where it was I kissed him. Here, and here, and there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I can't believe it's been 11 years since me and Luke um, last read together the Poets and Players. That seems an extraordinary amount of time. 11 years ago, a new Prime Minister who turned out to just be an empty suit, <laughs> global economic crisis, Tory government ravaging the country with austerity and cuts. How times change. <laughs> this next poem that I'll read is from, Pan it's from Pandemonium, the third book, and it's in five sections. Um, and it was just me kind of thinking about these last few years of, of politics, so kind of 2016 to 2020, and just kind of walking around my area of North Manchester, which is sort of Newton Heath and Moston. Um, and just trying to make sense and pay attention to that part of Manchester and, and to what was going on. Um, it's called Uncivil and um, it's got an epigraph from Sean O'Brien. It says, you think these people do not matter, then they do. What? Stepping out, brief bloodline of a comet heading home, unseasonal daffodils curling up, tricked by the few good days we've had and still this sludge of sodden leaves ankle deep down every lane the knitted pelts of cardigans strung up to the railings at the side of the chip shop the market trader even though the market is a car park now marking out his territory with bargain proclamations we thought we knew dishonesty but then this decade burning itself down to the wick, the wind turning branch against branch, forcing open the mouths of the vineyards. Two, I've seen one man dig into his groin at the Metrolink stop, stay standing as he finds the vein, steps off into himself. I've seen couples pass the spice between them, the dry and heavy smell of it, the way the body slumped but hardens, so they become crumbled statues of themselves, huddled down side streets, and daily now I see their tents pitched on scrubland by the road or on grass verges of the lock gates or hidden between trees so that when the tram's in motion, it's as though I see them behind bars. I've seen them spread like blood around a body, from the station to the central square to these outskirts, I've never known a sky like this, not scabbed with cloud, but nightly clear, as though the roof of the world were ripped clean off. Three. I remember seeing the schoolgirls pelted with petrol bombs as they walked to class. My neighbour telling me the woman in the house over the road stabbed her boyfriend in the face. Each night their voices bleed out through the bricks into the street. We sit pretending we are elsewhere, as you tell me of the car that followed your mother home, parked up, and then exploded minutes later. As your old class teacher who shakes and shakes, it's easy to forget that violence is mostly kept inside and look. Now, the girls are trying to walk to school again. Each side of the road flank like a muscular hedge with men, their voices and their broken glass and the police. 
their riot shields and batons, the girls are screaming. The girls are running the way you usually see people run from a burning building. Not suffer the little children, just really make them suffer. For each morning the walk beyond the workmen as they line up to change, crouch down as though they are swimmers and the curb is the edge of the ocean, slipping off pumps, lacing up boots, sometimes it's jogging bottom, shimmied down, replaced by practical canvas things, not clothing but protection, and always already the hive is illuminated by their own headlights and beyond them and beyond the train depot they service every day where single carriages lay like dormant cattle behind fences. The stucco of the terraces is cracked so the sides of the houses have branches and the railway hotel is no longer near a railway and has no beds to speak of. Though through the empty wrinkle of neck curtain there is a tinfoil glint of Christmas and as the day breaks itself apart, on the floor, the hatched egg of an upturned heart hat. Five. The new flats which will sit on the corner of the crossroads have been delayed. The scaffolding loosens its grip each day, sways like a newborn foal in the wind, gets clambered by children who use it to launch the building's own bricks at the road. The half pulled down, half rebuilt body vomiting itself onto the cars. This is regeneration. The old redressed, made shiny, heightened, except this one stalled for lack of money. The roof too old to fix, the front gone slack, the ground unstable, slipped like a disc from the spinal column. They'd all already sold. And now the buyers own a square of empty space, the way a creature does when it stakes a claim on where to sleep. The weather keeps on driving through the gap-toothed walls, doors that open onto nothing. When they say delayed, they really mean held back, like a man staggering to his feet to hurl himself back into the fight. Um, I'm reading another kind of city poem, I guess. Um, and I guess the only thing you need to know for this one is that it, sometimes as you're walking through cities, oftentimes kind of in late evening, you'll see people set up these kind of challenges or games that they kind of people have to pay money to take part in. There's one called Hang Tough, where you essentially just have to kind of hang on a metal railing for as long as possible in a kind of ludicrous test of masculinity. <laughs> it's called Hang Tough. The city has turned its lights off, people heave out of pubs like sudden rain, and on the corner, unexpected, a game of hang tuck. The iron bar, a single meat rack where the player reaches up, grabs, suspends their stretched taut limbs as long as possible. The trick is holding, hanging, living with the self, if only for minutes. When the flat face of the bicep begins to vibrate with the effort, when the shirt rides up, when the shameful slackness of the stomach is on show, keep holding. I'm tempted to test my luck, to show these men I have it in me to endure. You laugh, encourage me to have a go, but as I step towards the edge of the crowd, I feel the weight of the possible shame of failing of being a person too weak for their own body and so I pull away, your fingers on my shoulder trying to coax me back, back towards the challenge but I'm already walking, you a few steps behind and all night the thing gripped in the air between us is that we both know what happens when the body drops. <laughs> I guess that you know, that kind of interrogation of the masculinity and that kind of investigation of it is just something that I've been interested in um, across all three of those books um, that do all begin with P. Um, and 
more and more I kind of think, God, I just don't want to write another Andrew McMillan poem. There's enough Andrew McMillan poems in the world, I want to write about something else. And then I read this new story that you might well have seen that they, they discovered beneath a Van Gogh painting of flowers, another painting that he'd done of two men wrestling, and then he painted over it flowers and that's too easy. That's too obviously an Andrew McMillan poem. I'm not going to write that, that's too easy. But then it was in my head. And so I wrote it. And this is still life with meadow flowers and roses. Isn't this too easy? Beneath the flowers, the men are fighting, topless and blooded, clutching the stems of each other's arms, trying not to be toppled, trying to be the wind. The strong veined leaves of their torsos curling towards each other, red poppies blushing where they're cut. Beneath the fighters, the flower of a bruise. Beneath one thing, another. Beneath one man, another man. The floral notes of gin too much above the meadow scent of soil. Beneath one hand, the neck. Beneath the other hand, the hole in which he'll plant himself, where the blooming will be hidden, held tight inside the tunnel, the fingers held to dig. One man wrapping his hands around the waist of another whose limbs are drooping, whose clothes are scattered at the end of the bed and beneath them both. The salt outline of their temporary life spreads towards the sun until the duvet washes over them and they're gone. Man on the train eating doughs. <laughs> each time the hand reaches in, each time the noise like scrunching paper, each one brought out, each soft circle, each flick of the tongue, each ghost of sugar in the mid-morning air, each fall of dust, each empty hand, each reaching lick for any remnant, each self-contented smile, each cuticle of icing pressed against the lips, each brief pause before returning, each return. I must read um, a couple more poems. This one is very short. And just about, well, you know, the horror of being alive. <laughs> it's called living. The calamity of having to exist in the world. Piss blush across grey joggers as you step outside. The self leaking through the self. People turning. Um, I'll read this one final poem. It's been so such a joy to, to be back at Poets and Players to hear this amazing music um, and to read with Jennifer and to read with Luke has just been, been really lovely. Um, and I should say thank you to Suzanne for that fantastic introduction. And Suzanne's been doing this amazing thing where she's been walking 100 miles this month to raise, raise money for um, a refugee charity. And so do talk to her about that as well. Saying it's a fantastic thing that, that she's been doing. Um, it feels really spring-like today, um, which means that, I don't know, the year feels as though it's turning into this kind of brighter space, potentially. Um, and I became very interested last year in kind of, again, just paying attention to this part of North Manchester that, that I live in and trying to pay attention to the sort of turning of the seasons and what would it mean to kind of write pastoral poetry, but about that kind of urban space in North Manchester. Um, and so looking even further forward than spring, I thought I'd finish this off with summer. Summer and the smell of the tip coming in, strong as the flowers in the backyard are colourful, and the dog ships drying quicker, becoming neater to lift from the shingle like shells, and all things becoming easier, waking in the morning, getting through the day, so now we're in the loft, 
ceiling woolen jumpers like precious cargo of an earlier, darker age. And when you crack the velox window like opening a fresh tin of paint, beyond the low roofs, the city skyline is shimmering like a lake I dream of pushing you headlong into. Thank you very much.